Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. We're here today with special guests, Katie Desiderio and Michael Frino, who are here to share with us their new book, The Beekeeper, Pollinating Your Organization for Transformational Growth. So has your business or life reached a plateau and you're just not sure how to move forward successfully? Well, today's show is just for you. So Katie Desiderio is a Willie Disc Partner and Partner in Learning at Proximal Development, LLC, her leadership development consultancy. She's also a professor of management at Moravian University School of Business and Economics. Michael Frino is a Willie Disc partner and oversees human capital development for a division of a Fortune 500 med tech company. He also leads DEI program management and leadership development. So let's welcome to the show Katie Desiderio and Michael Frino. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks for having us. What an honor it is to have the both of you here and to talk about this book. But before we dive into the book, I'd love to learn how your business and working relationship started. Yeah. So Mike and I actually met in in graduate school. So uh, we both attended Barry University. Um, It's where we got our PhD in organizational learning and leadership. And we kind of went through the program at a different pace um, on different campuses. And we kind of found our, found ourselves, you know, working together in the research space um, over time. And, you know, Mike and I, I guess it's now been over a decade, had been publishing in the academic journal space. Um, and we came to a point where a couple of years ago, uh, we started talking about writing a book together. And really for me in the you know, scholarly space. I work in higher education. And so there's requirements for me as a faculty member in, you know, research and publication. And so we started to kind of move out of our comfort zones to think about how we could do research in unconventional ways, which really led us to this book that we wrote together, The Beekeeper. Anything you'd like to add to that, Michael? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, it was uh, kind of always been a passion of ours to to do something a little different than academic papers. So We've always thought about it. So uniquely, a couple of years ago, when we had a chance to to connect, we were we were out on business. I was in Chicago. Uh, Katie was in Chicago for a different reason, and we decided to meet up. And that's kind of where the the brainstorming started to happen uh, around the book. So, where did the idea of the beekeeper come from? Yeah, I love Mike. Mike kind of left a little teaser. Mike, do you want to finish the story of what happened in that yeah. um, Chicago <laughs> over <laughs> Chicago pizza? Yeah, sure. We actually still, uh, Marion, still have the pizza box uh, to this day. But, um, you know, a lot of times people talk about back of the napkin moments. And uh, like I said, we were both, you know, kind of in Chicago, we grabbed pizza together and we started mapping out like what could a could a story look like? And so because we're both in the organizational development leadership space, I kind of work in, in um, you know, med tech and, and, and run leadership development. We started talking about pollination, right? And the, and the way we can kind of be uh, growth partners and essentially growth advocates for our organization and, and the people we work with. And when we, when we came across the word pollination and we started writing that down, we said, oh, well, bees are, are pollinators and, and they do, uh, they pollinate everything around us and help everything around us grow. So we started mapping out kind of what a, a story would look like on the back of that box around, around bees. And as true researchers, you know, Katie and I said, okay, you know, maybe this is something but we weren't quite sure. So Katie, do you want to, you want to talk about the aha moment um, that happened? Yeah. And, and so first, Marianne, as we talked about pollination and bees, we kind of had this aha moment that in both of our worlds, people were really resonating with stories, which is why we decided to go with a fable. And then to Mike's point, we said, well, if bees, right, it kind of makes sense to us, right? That bees help all things grow and seemingly leaders should too. And so we should probably learn more about that. And so we went home from Chicago and 18 days later, it was UN World Bee Day. And Mike sent me a text message and said, oh my gosh, you know, I think this was meant to be, right? Pun intended. Um, And so we immediately started our research connecting, you know, Mike's in South Florida and I'm in Pennsylvania. Um, We started connecting locally with local beekeepers to just learn more. And then we did some experiences together. 
uh, to kind of see just what a beekeeper does to ensure that a hive thrives. And that really gave a lot of the inspiration that informed how we wrote the fable. What a great story. And to keep the pizza box, that must be a very valuable thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For sure. What a great story. Well, and so when we look at bee, you know, the, the research that you did in regards to um, bees and, and their hives, what type of parallels did you draw with leadership? Yeah, it, it's really interesting. You know, we talked to a lot of different beekeepers, but they really are the, 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 the champions of the hive, right? They have to make sure that the environment is right for bees to do their best work and bees to go out and, and help the environment around them. And it really is up to the beekeeper to ensure that the environment is is right for the bees to do their work. And so when the beekeeper told us that and kind of kept giving us that message, we we really attributed that to the way leaders and organizations need to think. You know, a lot of us want to be able to grow within our companies and, and on our teams and individually. But if the environment is not really right, then it's very difficult for people to do that. So that was one of the major lessons that we kind of... Uh, came out of the book and came out of the conversations with the the beekeepers. And I'll add something to that. Um, You know, Mike and I kind of to round out our experience after the book, you know, hit bookshelves and, you know, we saw some success with it. We decided to go back to the beehive that, you know, kind of inspired a lot of our early work and we spent time with them and, you know, we wanted to thank them for, you know, how much they inspired the work we did. And we said, let's go, let's go back out, right. With, with your bees and learn a little bit. And we watched in this moment, and this was really kind of in in unsuspecting ways, we watched the beekeeper, you know, kind of going through the hive with us. She couldn't find the queen. And uh, she was looking through all of the panels and she said, you know, the, the queen is really not producing in this hive. And when she finally located the queen, it was in the very last panel, right? Right before our eyes, without even thinking, she squashed the queen and dropped the queen to the bottom of the hive. And Mike and I were almost like, what, you know, what just happened, you know? And she said, oh, we're at the point in the season that if I would let this queen here, all of my bees would be dead when I came back after the winter, And so in order for me to ensure what Mike just said, that the environment is sound for the bees to thrive, sometimes I have to make those hard decisions. And so I drop her to the bottom so her pheromones are still there. So they feel safe. Over time, they'll realize that they need a new queen. And so there's opportunities for her to combine hives, right? Or for them to, right, designate a new queen. And so, so interestingly in organizations, sometimes where we take too long, right, to make decisions, or we escalate commitment to something that ends up hurting, right, people over time where we shouldn't. And so there's parallels in us thinking about, right, how we are creating that environment for our people to do the work that they do best, right, but to help them thrive in a way that helps all things around them grow. What a phenomenal piece to add, and I I like how this comes together in parallel tracks, how often we see businesses that maybe have one too many queens or there's something that's off within the business itself, within the culture, or as you talk also about the atmosphere, the environment. So how, why don't we start with this? Why don't you share a little bit about the beekeeper with us, the fable with us, but we're we're not going to do any um, spoiler alerts here. So, sure, yeah. So when Katie and I started, you know, kind of thinking about the book and writing the book, we wanted it to kind of kind of be real, but also recognize that it is a it is a fable. So we had to kind of accelerate kind of the concepts. Um, you know, when people read this fable, they're going to recognize that you know probably what happens within the book, you know, maybe not can't really happen in the same time frame that uh you know that that happens in the book and in real organizations however i think the lessons are are really important so we go on a we go on a journey with a business owner Catherine, who's the protagonist who is dealing with kind of a an op, a great opportunity a growing company her company's thriving but like many organizations when companies start to grow and get bigger and hire more people they they sometimes forget about why they got started and, and what was foundational to kind of them starting the business, kind of their mission and their values. And, and we see this happening a little bit in Catherine's company. And she ends up going on a vacation with her family, which, you know, really she didn't want to do. It wasn't a vacation that was inspiring to her. It's a trip to a family farm. And 
And that's where she meets a beekeeper. And similar to kind of Katie's and Katie and I's research, uh, Catherine meets a beekeeper and, and learns a number of lessons, uh, you know, from the beekeeper during her family vacation that she takes back to the, the organization. And so as we wrote the book, I'll add to what Mike just said, each chapter is a bee mindset, B-E. And so if you notice in the title of the book, right, it's it's spelled the traditional way of beekeeper, but the second E in B is dotted uh, very intentionally because we ask readers to think about from a leadership perspective, choosing who and how you want to be. And so oftentimes we forget that we have the volition to choose. And so there's a sense of agency of giving yourself permission to choose who and how you want to be every day when you show up, but to think about how your choices impact the people around you from a leadership perspective. And so while each chapter is a B mindset, you know, we draw readers in to say, you're not limited to the B mindsets that we've identified in the chapters, but for you to identify what your B mindsets are, and then to be able to effectively communicate them through your words and actions. Well, and it seems that the beekeeper really dives into more than leadership. I would offer that it also dives into how people live their lives and and the small shifts that they can make to just be a more fulfilled person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, B mindsets don't necessarily just have to apply to organizations. You know, it's kind of you know, at home, uh, in personal and professional life, it's it's to Katie's point, choosing you know who you, who and how you want to be, and, and and sometimes you know it's it's not easy for people, right? This we talk a lot about um, growth mindset and having a fixed mindset, and and some people say, well, this is this is who I am, and this is how I want to show up, and and that's okay if that's who they naturally are, but are they willing to kind of think differently and think about ways to do things differently continually and, and try to improve to to show up differently? Uh, to encourage kind of, you know, personal fulfillment, but, you know, fulfillment in other people's lives as well. So, you know, well said, well said. So what is an area where you see most companies and just leaders get stuck? Uh, You know, I'm thinking about a conversation that, you know, we've been having a lot lately, especially post-pandemic, and that's really with change. You know, one of the things that we realize in the work that we do is, something that's harder for adults to do than learning is unlearning. And so, you know, to Mike's point, as we're thinking about kind of holding that pen and authoring our story personally and professionally, uh, sometimes we get stuck in habits, right? We do it the way that we've always done it, or we do what just makes sense to us because that's the way we think. And so in this space of kind of keeping ourselves in one of the chapters of the book is be proximal, And in the spirit of learning about how to be proximal, it's really keeping learning right at the core of all you do. And so in that that space of learning, that is associated also with unlearning. So we have these opportunities to really think about, um, you know, in the spirit of who and how we want to be, that we can unlearn the way that we've always done it and learn new ways. And that's not always easy and it could take time. But when we think about the investment, right, we always say what what we give our time and energy to grows. We have to make sure that we're ensuring the right things are growing. Um, And so in that space of pollination, right, we have to pollinate ourselves, but then allow the people around us to realize that they have the opportunity to do the same. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Mary Ann. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Hey, pay attention, everybody. Amy Vaughn and myself, Dutch Mendenhall, are hosting an event. Have you ever felt like the wealthiest in America play by a different rule book? Even if you earn well, make money, invest wisely, educate yourself, there is an invisible barrier. It separates you from the financial security enjoyed by America's elite. The economic landscape changes every day. The wealthy elite know how to stay ahead of it because we play by a different rule book. At InvestWell Summit, we'll share all the plays and we're making it to win. Spots are going to sell out fast at InvestWell Summit. So get your butt to investwellsummit.com and secure your seat now. Are you a coffee lover who wants to make a difference? Look no further than Fire Department Coffee, a veteran-owned business that gives back to support first responders in need. Each batch of coffee is freshly roasted right here in the USA by a dedicated team of first responders and coffee experts. 
So when you enjoy a cup of Fire Department coffee, you're not only drinking high-quality coffee, you're supporting members of your community. Start your day with a coffee that gives back. Visit FireDepartmentCoffee.com. That's Fire, D-E-P-T, Coffee.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Mary Ann. We're here today with special guests, Katie Desiderio and Michael Frino, who are here to share with us their new book, The Beekeeper, Pollinating Your Organization for Transformational Growth. You have many different, um, as you talked about, the BE um, listed in the chapters in regards to being present or curious. So when we talk about be messy, I was a little surprised by that. So why be messy? Probably actually one of you know my favorite chapters, to be honest with you. Um, you know, sometimes we we think about like having the, the perfectly structured environment, right? Where everything, you know, is mapped out. And you know, what we realize a lot of times that some of the best ideas, the best work comes when you kind of let your guard down and, and give yourself the permission to to be a little messy and think think differently and and do things differently. Um you, you learn from others that way. You know, you don't kind of always stay on your track. And so in, in the chapter, that's, ex- that's exactly kind of the, what, what, what the chapter is about. It's, it's letting yourself be messy and thinking about things differently and getting out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, the analogy that you know, kind of, I always like to use is, is we're not growing unless we're, we're doing something hard. And, and that's what kind of being messy is all about. What is another B that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, there's so, there's so many. I mean, I think for, for, you know, just thinking about my uh, personal opportunities for development, you know, being vulnerable is really important. I'm a pretty, you know, private individual. Uh, naturally, that's my natural kind of style is, is to, to be a little more reserved. But, you know, recognizing that in, in organizations and, and working with many different peoples, different temperaments, uh, different styles, some people, you know, really require a lot of vulnerability to, to build trust, right? And, and, and one of the other things that, you know, we talk about organizations and something that's really frequently on their mind right now. It's like, how do we build trust among our organization at, at all levels? And so when you can see leaders start demonstrating a little vulnerability about their strengths, their opportunities for growth personally, you know, where they're working, you know, we see, you know, a lot of other people start doing that as well. And we have a very authentic, uh, authentic conversations usually lead to uh, more productive conversations. So for employers that are looking and small businesses that are looking to change their business culture, where would they start? Yeah. So um, actually I I do a lot of this work in my work at the university and in the consulting space. Um, And so, you know, ultimately, and and we do this, Mike and I do this when we do keynotes for the book is we really kind of deconstruct um, the tri-level of leadership, right? Looking at the individual group and organization. And so at the organizational level, if executive leaders are looking at culture, right, at the macro level, we have to think about, right, alignment of purpose. And so, you know, thinking about the purpose of why we do what we do, right, what is the company's mission? Is there alignment around that? How does each individual's purpose align to that? And so oftentimes, you know, we fail to effectively communicate, right, both in words and actions, but we have to make sure that words and actions match, And so there's an undertone as we think about, you know, the book and how we transform culture is that 
you know, we need to do what Mike said at the individual level, recognize that deep level diversity is present. We are different. We show up different. We bring different talents, right? And we want to make sure that we're encouraging that, that we're unapologetically and authentically, right, inviting people to the conversation. But we have to make sure that there's alignment and understanding, you know, the value of the work that we're doing. And so this goes back to what I mentioned earlier that through change, right, sometimes, right, we fail to communicate effectively role clarity, or we fail to effectively communicate, right, expectations. We fail to effectively communicate because we get lost in the routine of the way that we've always done it. And so the protagonist in the book is kind of taken out of her routine. And I don't want this to be a spoiler alert, but she goes on a vacation that she really didn't want to go on, right? And sometimes the best things happen in the places that we don't want to be. But how do we be present to continue to learn, to see opportunities, right? To invite people in, to help us see the ways forward. Um, And so many ways, right? But really, you know, going back to your question is kind of looking at that tri-level of leadership and first at the organizational level, right? How are we effectively communicating why we do what we do? And then how are we inviting the individuals in to be part of, right? Being that purpose and mission to life in meaningful ways. So when we talk about really having that active role in the growth of our employees and leadership team, what does that look like? Is it attending more webinars? Is it just really, like as you were mentioning just a minute ago, gaining more clarity in regards to roles and responsibilities? I think one of the ways that, you know, just building on what Katie said about the tri-level of leadership is, I think the first step is is, is self-awareness. And, and, uh, and, and leadership really needs to take a Kind of turn the mirror a little bit sometimes and, and look at themselves and say, okay, who am I, right? What is my leadership philosophy? Uh, what is my leadership style? And am I communicating that effectively to to others, right? Because if, if people don't know why someone is doing something or why they're showing up a certain way or what's important to them, then then things break down, relationships break down. So if you're trying to transform a culture or transform a, a team, the leader needs to turn the mirror and say, let me, let me do a little bit of self-reflection, right? Why, why am I the way I am? What informed my behaviors today from my past, right? What is my personality style, um, my, my traits, my deep level diversity attributes that many people don't see that, that lie below the surface um, that I need to start clearly articulating and communicating? Because once that happens, we see a fundamental change in the way people interact. And when, when interactions change, then, then culture changes. Why is it important for us to be energizing in a business? I I know that's something that is mentioned within your book. Well, energy is contagious, right? And so, you know, there's a space of, um, we we want people to be the energy in the room, right? And so that, that comes down to that space of agency of like, let's show up and let's not point the finger, but let's choose who and how we want to be. We don't have to be a certain way because so and so is a certain way, right? But how are we showing up with the energy to kind of drive, right? What we want to see more of? How are we modeling more of the behaviors that we want to see? How are we mindful, right, of that emotional contagion as we're working with and through others? Thank you. I appreciate you explaining that. I mean, there's so many great points that you make within your book. What do you think is a takeaway that someone can use in their life today that would help shift their life around? You know, I think one of the things we wrote first on the pizza box was the word be proximal. And Katie mentioned it earlier, but demonstrating that behavior of really the art of learning to be proximal, which which proximal by definition means kind of center closest to the heart in, in medical terms. And so I often I often see that that if people want to really start being a, a change agent or thinking about ways to engage their teams differently or change a culture at an organization or just improve themselves, they either A, have to find a growth partner to help them do it. Because sometimes we we get we get stuck in our own ways and, and, and sometimes someone needs to reveal to us that, hey, you know, this is how you're showing up and this is the impact of, of, of that. If you don't have someone in your life who can tell you that and tell you the hard things, then um, then it becomes really, really difficult. So I would say find someone who is your growth partner that can help you um, you know, really see things the way maybe you're not seeing them. And that's really what it means to demonstrate the art of learning to be proximate is placing yourself at the center of someone else's growth 
and, and really contributing to their, their success. Would you like to add anything to that, Katie? Yeah, I love, I love, I love what Mike said. I would go, to, I would have given the same advice as to, you know, just be proximal. Um, in addition to doing it for your growth partners, there's a space of what Mike mentioned earlier of how he said to be vulnerable. And I think that, you know, there's an undertone for all of us that if we show up as leaders committed to learning and growth every day, right? I just want to be better tomorrow. Um, we could do that, right? The art of learning to be proximal for ourselves and for others. But in the absence of that vulnerability, it's hard to do. When you have corporations that reach out to the both of you, they, they've read the book, The Beekeeper, and they love it. And they're like, okay, we need to get going. We need to start implementing this right away. What is like the number one thing they need to work on initially? Well, it, it really depends. I love that question that you've asked is, you know, we, we like to make sure, you know, that it's personalized. Everyone is facing different barriers to entry. Um, but Mike and I actually on our website created growth guides for just this reason, because we have a lot of people who reach out, right? Some people need work at the individual level. Some people need work at the team level, right? Some people need work right at the macro level. Some just want to do a book read to get you know, thinking and creativity and innovation going. And so we have a growth guide for that as well. And so, you know, that space is kind of meeting people where they are, recognizing that there's not a one size fits all. Um, and that's why we wrote the fable in a way that's open to interpretation for people to kind of take the lessons and learnings to say, well, what makes sense where I am? And how do I personalize this to make sure that the returns on my time investment are high? What do the both of you want readers and our listeners to take away from the beekeeper? You know, I think we, you know, Katie and I went on this journey. We are just humbled really by, you know, all the excitement around the book. So, you know, for our readers, you know, I think for us, it's, it's, it's share with us, you know, um, you know, what the book meant to you. I mean, we, we, we want to, we want adoption and we want people to kind of feel the inspiration that our so many readers have already shared with us. And, you know, when we hit Wall Street Journal bestseller, it was really humbling for us. Um, but, but it, it just keeps continuing. And so I think for, for me, and I, you know, I'm sure Katie will echo this and may have some, something else to add, but like, we like to hear the feedback. We like to hear the, get the emails and the comments on social, just telling us how it impacted, you know, their themselves personally, their teams and, and their culture. So, you know, for readers, you know, we just say, say thank you in advance. Is there any surprising feedback that you've received? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, just in the, in the spirit of being vulnerable, you know, when you get out there in the in the, in the world, right, and and you're writing a book for for like really the first time, and it hits the Wall Street Journal bestseller, and then all of a sudden you got people who really love it, and you got people who really don't like it. So, I mean, we're okay with that. We love that feedback. It helps us grow. And you know, some of the things we actually illuminated on this on this um, on this this call, you know, were the direct result of some of the feedback that we had. You know, people have told us that this doesn't seem realistic that you can implement change a culture in one week. Well you know, th that's true. So, you know, we're making sure we're intentional about saying that because it is a fable and we want people to know that these are behaviors that, you know, probably will have to be um, developed over time and, and, mm -hmm. and done over time. But um, so we, we love feedback. Feedback's a gift. We always say that good, good, bad, or, or, or indifferent. Well, it's easy to see that readers would pick this book and read it again and again and again, and get something different every single time. And I can understand when you're saying it's not a one week read. It's, of course, that's part of how the fable, you know, you can't have it be war and peace. It has to end at some point. <laughs> but it allows really the reader to dive into the changes they can make. And I was so impressed with that. Well, thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you for sharing that, Marianne. We, we've heard that from readers too. Like I couldn't put it down or it made me really self-reflect. You know, it's making me really rethink. Um, and those are all the goals that Mike and I had as we were writing it. Do you have leaders that say, okay, this week we're going to focus on being fulfilled and we'll, you know, or this month, and then we'll move on to the next one the following month? Yeah, we've had a lot of different adoptions in the public school space. We We've had a lot of principals adopt the book and really adopt the themes of the B mindsets, whether it was weekly or monthly, or even as people adopted B mindsets for a school year. And so when you look at a, you know, the, uh, the honeycomb, right? Each piece of the honeycomb is a hexagon. And so we've had a lot of schools really creatively take a hexagon, ask people to adopt 
right? Their B mindset. And then kind of putting all of their individual hexagons there to kind of make up the hive. Um, and so there's a representation of communicating, right? Here's what I'm committing to for whatever length of time. But here's what it means when we all collectively come together with our different B mindsets to really make the hive thrive. So really creative things and have shared those things with us. But then too, we've had people go through with our growth guides and look at, right, kind of just chapter by chapter, uh, kind of looking at what what we've presented and then, you know, leaving it open to interpretation. I can see where that would be such an empowering exercise to be able to do that and see how everyone is really part of a larger whole. So mm -hmm. my goodness, Katie and Mike, Michael, we can uh, talk forever. You guys are such an inspiration. I just loved your book, The Beekeeper. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? Yeah. So we have a website. I think Katie mentioned it earlier. It's, um, leadershipfables.com. And so all those growth guides are on there, but all our social media, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to create a, a little following, which we're super excited about. So we encourage people to follow us on, on social and we're, we're posting, you know, daily different, different, uh, different, you know, motivational stuff and different uh, reflective moments and in and, and, and content. So you know, we're hoping people follow along on the journey as, as they go on as well. You know, um, and you also asked about, you know, where people could, access our book. And so it's available on Barnes and Noble and Amazon, but certainly you could reach out to Mike and I individually as well. Well, that is exciting. I saw where people can purchase books in bulk on your website for their organizations. And I highly suggest that. Well, Katie and Michael, thank you both so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you for having us, Marianne. Yes, thanks for having us. Well, Katie and Michael, it's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Beekeeper, Pollinating Your Organization for Transformational Growth. The Beekeeper is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support our indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Mary Ann where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.